Good afternoon. Welcome. Welcome. Uh, please come on in. I'm going to go ahead and get started. I want to be right on time. Uh, does everybody know who this is here? Yeah, that's our doctor. That's Dr. Hector. That's Dr. Hector. <laughs> uh, the, the, the man behind the voice that we heard last week. Um, we did get the recording, uh, and that came through just fine, but uh, unfortunately we didn't get the image. Those of you who were here last week, so I thought I'm going to look this guy up and set up it looks like. So, so there he is. Uh, so the recordings are now available. Uh, session one and session two on our website, on the church's website, umcgp.org slash caring ministries. There's, there's uh, three items, I think, on that on that page of the website. So you're welcome to take a, a look and a listen uh, to those. Uh, that is, uh, yeah, I think if you go to the website, umc.org, then you'll, uh, it will be connect. Um, there's a there's a category connect, and under connect is where the caring ministries thing will show pop up. But you'll find it if you if you get a chance to get in that website. If you have any problems, um, talk to somebody in the office here. Um, and so anyway, just a couple of things that I wanted to let you know about in terms of announcements for today. Uh, first of all, to say, I mentioned last week that Valley Assistance has a virtual experience that you can uh, experience what it's like to actually have dementia. And so um, that is available through Valley Assistance. And when I talked to Chris Erickson, the director, she said people should just call her or the office and schedule their time. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes. And apparently it's, an, it's something that they like to use for training for people. So uh, for our, basically our security people, um, sheriff's auxiliary and other people have a chance to, to learn about that. So that's the two numbers there, 625-1477 uh, and 625-5966. Uh, if you didn't get a copy of the caregiver's guide, um, be sure to pick one up. We have a few of them left, and they're free. Um, and then also, I, I put it there, and this is the book that Dr. Hector had recommended last week called uh, Dementia Together. And so I just got a copy of it, and I'm reading about the uh, woman who developed basically this model of communication so that the communication continues. So it tips about how to communicate with people with dementia. Very important so that the, the isolation is, is there. So those are the big announcements for today. And now I'm going to introduce you to a couple of people. Um, first of all, through a website, Rick and Martha Fury. So it'll take me just a minute to get to that website. In the meanwhile, before I say that, the, the um, you all should have a piece of paper, a blank piece of paper and a pen, and that's for your questions. So when we come time to the time of questions, if you could write them down, jot them down, and uh, that'll give us a chance to, to capture your questions for today, and then you can turn them in, and we'll have them for, uh, for other times when we can address those issues. So hang on just a minute.
four months before her 57th birthday. Martha and I were high school sweethearts. You heard that opposites attract. That was the case with us. She was outgoing, independent, and headstrong. I was shy and laid back. Those who know me now would say that I'm anything but shy. I give Martha the credit for training me all those years. We dated on and off for five years until she realized I was the best thing that could ever happen to her. We married in 1975, a year after I graduated from college. We always wanted a big family. We had four children, three sons and a daughter. Our lives were full of activities with the kids, school events, sports, and vacations. We were always on the go. Once they graduated from college and moved out and got married, our activities shifted more around us. We began to travel. This was great for us and that Martha loved photography and I loved meeting all these new people. We also began to volunteer more at the church. I never realized how fulfilling that would be until I did it. I mentioned Martha loved photography. Martha also loved to crochet, work with her plants, and babysit the grandkids. We now have nine. But Alzheimer's has changed our lives. Photography is over for her. She can't work the camera. She still crochets, but it's more just manipulating the yarn. But it's satisfying to her, and that is what is important. She still works with her plants for hours, but as time goes on, it is more and more difficult. She is very proud of her hundred or so African violets and orchids. Martha was great raising our kids. She always had the touch with babies. With our first few grandkids, she picked up where she left off with our own children. Now she can't babysit without me. Our days now are what some might describe as boring. I prefer to say routine, routine, routine. People who understand Alzheimer's know that when you change your routine, for the person living with dementia, the brain has a hard time adjusting. We still do things, even vacation, but they are things that we have done multiple times in the past. We travel to Disney World several times a year, some with our kids, grandkids and sometimes just the two of us but we stay at familiar locations with familiar room layouts she still likes the photography but now makes me take the pictures we go out to eat regularly but only to restaurants that know us and know about her illness the staff makes a point to talk with her and some even give her a hug and all that just makes her so happy we enjoy each other's company and just like to sit and watch a movie or sporting event on TV my single biggest joy in life is making Martha laugh. She is fully aware of her illness and what she can no longer do. That can bring on tears and depression. My weakness is her crying. I'll do whatever I can to keep her smiling and laughing. My biggest joy can also be my biggest challenge. Remember, I said Martha was independent. She was used to doing things on her own and in her way. As she declines, trying to keep her happy becomes increasingly difficult. My greatest fear is my inability to take care of her. We laugh when I say that the offer I promised through sickness and health and good times and bad, that I would be there. I know it's a bit conceived to think that I can take care of the best, but we have grown up together and she trusts me totally. This journey is like on-the-job training. There's so many books out there and numerous classes, but until you live it for yourself, 24-7, you just can't realize what it's like. Once you get past the initial anger and they ask you why, you move on. Patience and understanding are essential. Living with the sadness of watching your loved ones slowly slip away takes courage, but knowing she would be there for you keeps you going. Since her diagnosis, I'd probably pray more than I had before. What I ask for is the good health so that I can always be there for her. I have found that my church is here to help. Due West offers a caregiver's ministry for families like mine. Recently, I approached the church to seek out someone who might be willing to sit and crochet with Martha. The company and crochet will keep her mind active. The response was heartwarming, and someone quickly volunteered. Some churches are becoming more dementia aware, but it's not fast enough. We need to find better ways to reach families like mine. Most people still see it as strictly a disease of the elderly, a loss of memory. It is so, so much more. What I hope that I have accomplished today is to give you a sense of what it's like on a day-to-day -day basis. There are sad times, there are happy times. You try to have more happy than sad, but it clearly has a dramatic impact on your lives. And I hope you can walk away today with a better feel for that so that when you're back in your own organizations, you can promote the support that is needed 
for these families. Thank you. That's an example of the kind of things that they have on their website available to anyone that wants to go to that site. It, uh, again, has been really helpful for us to learn about the work that that church is doing. And we're uh, really um, inspired by their example. Um, we think that they have uh, really found it a really important ministry for us to, to uh, consider as a church and as a community. So we want to talk more about the community itself um, a little bit later, but um, now it's my pleasure to introduce you to um, Linda Laird. Um, when Reverend Ken Benson and I were talking about this ministry, we talked about how important it was to have someone who would be able to speak to the issue directly. Um, Linda, uh, I became acquainted with her through my sister, and so uh, we met basically through Zoom. I didn't know how short she was. <laughs> uh, but because she always seems to me to be such a tall, impressive person. And I think you'll feel the same way about her. Uh, Linda and I have also done some work together on her nonprofit called Books for Classrooms, which is a wonderful uh, effort that she's making. So, Linda, uh, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I never thought I'd be talking about this because once it's over, it tends to be over. But I'm happy to share with you what my journey was like with my husband. We were in second marriages. Um, we had children in Tucson. Actually, my, my children were in Tucson. His children were in Kansas. We were, we were living in Kansas, and we were coming here as snowbirds. We had inherited the villa, which was very nice, but we were too young to use it. So um, we knew that we would come back to Tucson. I've lived in Tucson off and on since 1971. My children were here. My grandchildren are here. My great-granddaughters are here, which has been the joy of my life now. So, this started when I began to recognize some symptoms, some unusual behaviors, like not paying bills, and not worrying about it. Very calmly, just not paying bills. My husband began to not converse as much. I had to generate conversations when we were driving. Things were just a little bit off. And they continued to get more and more off until we went to our family physician in Kansas who did a sweet 16, what they call the sweet 16 test, and he did not pass. It turned out that his aunt had passed with Alzheimer's or dementia many, many years before. How did you get to end with this? Yeah. <laughs> We've got it turned up as loud as we can. I, I, sorry, I do have a soft voice. Raise your hand and I'll try harder if you can't hear. So once we had the diagnosis, we had to start talking about serious matters because we were going back and forth between two states. We went to, um, an elder lawyer in Kansas and an elder lawyer here in Tucson because we were moving between two states and we wanted to be sure that all our paperwork was in, in place. And my husband was very concerned that I probably, as the survivor, hopefully, uh, would have the resources when this journey was finished, because it can be an expensive journey. 
So we got that over with. We kind of turned hope into cope because I don't know about you, but I've never heard of anybody surviving dementia. It's just not in the nature of the beast. And it's very important as caregivers that we acknowledge that early, decide how we intend to handle it so that we do survive. Because surviving Surviving is, is important both to the person who has the dementia and to the caregiver. So we got the financial stuff in order that protected our resources. For me, then came the training. I did online classes. I did uh, reading books. The Alzheimer's Association in Tucson at that point had a caregiver's training course, and they taught me to lie. Now, I was raised in Kansas as a good Southern Baptist girl. We do not lie. But the truth is, every time I took a break and said, I gotta go to this quilt conference. It was a lie. I was taking a break because of a caregiver. I needed a break. <laughs> and you know, you correcting people, their reality is slightly different. And better to just merge into their reality and agree because you're not going to change it. So you go on with whatever it is and keep it as comfortable as possible. Because if they're comfortable, you can be a lot more comfortable as a caregiver. You know, there's a lot of hard decisions to make when you have this diagnosis. And one of the decisions we made early on was that we were only going to do comfort care. Now that's just kind of not the way we work as people normally. We want to go to the doctor. We want to get it fixed. We want each thing that comes along to be treated. But the reality with dementia is if you if you put if you if you sedate someone and we, we did my husband had a cataract, had cataracts after the first cataract you could see the drop in cognition as he dropped to the floor off and on for several weeks we did not do the second cataract. It's, it's those kinds of decisions that I found very, very hard all the way to the end. But they were the right decisions because we made them together early. And we included family, which meant that I had the support of, of the children and the grandchildren who would immediately come to help if needed. But they understood that we had made the decision that we were not going to treat some conditions. That was also hard for doctors to understand because doctors are trained to make people better. And one thing my husband on the way home from Tucson said, if not I've got one eye that's sort of fuzzy. And I said, well, Robert, it'll probably, it's probably just something in the cold way. A month later, he mentions to me that my eye is still fuzzy. He had um, a detached retina 
Oh. He just hadn't noticed. Now the, the surgeon thought it was great to go ahead. But of course you can't touch it for weeks and weeks. It's terribly painful. It's going to be probably a catastrophe. And after a month of being detached, it wasn't gonna wasn't gonna reattach itself. But he made me feel very guilty in making that decision. So I got my resources together, which included my family, the Alzheimer's Association, and our, our eye doctor here. And they all agreed that it was better not to treat it. It was better to be, it was more compassionate to be born in one heart than to go through the pain and not have much um, success. We looked around once we moved to, to Green Valley permanently for all the resources. And we moved here because I said to the doctor, this is, you know, we, we like you here in Green Valley or in Tucson. So we'll come every six months for your treatment, but then my husband wants to live still in Kansas because he had lived in Kansas all his life in the same county, mind you. <laughs> so the doctor just looked at him and said, that doesn't make sense. You've got better treatment here. You've got better caring resources here. And you've got family here. The next day, my husband said, let's go look for a house. And we did. We found one within a few days. And we went back to close that big old house in Kansas. It was a smart move. We, we looked for the resources here. And we did find SAB. And that was what an important recess because when he started wandering, and believe me, some of them get to it, and you mustn't feel guilty about it. When, when SAV has done their interview and taken the picture and had you in their resource file, they're going to respond quicker in a better way because they know immediately the right picture to put up to their other, the people that they're working with to try to find the, that person who has wandered away. Or, as one died, the husband walked the dog and he came to the wrong house. I was so mad at that dog. <laughs> <laughs> But the neighbor called the cops. <laughs> when the cops got there, they quickly understood the situation. And I think part of it was that he was already in the file of a hundred people who they knew had this concern. And then they just brought him home. So that helps. Don't overlook your fire department either. You want that little key to thing on your front door so that they can get in your house immediately if you need them to be there. And as you do that, they're going to get acquainted with you. They're going to know that there is this situation and they will be available to you because they behave like neighbors. And there will be times, perhaps, I couldn't get up my husband. He's on the floor. You, you have no choice but to call them. And they're very good to come. Now we can order groceries, which would have been a wonderful benefit. We also quickly learned about La Posada's daycare, which is wonderful. And if you don't have a lot of resources, 
don't let that stop you because they had scholarships through the Penal Council on the aging. So don't overlook any resources that you might be able to access. Lapisado was wonderful. It was just a great space for him. And he could go several mornings a week. And I could do the errands and the things I needed to do to run the household and to maintain my sanity. <laughs> because that's part of it, too. The other thing that for, for us was very important was the dog. We had Shelties, and um, the Sheltie was just by him 24-7. I understand that having a dog will create endorphins. Creating endorphins keeps people happy to, toward the end, be sitting in your chair. Having the dog is going to make you feel calm and very pleasant. That was, I think, quite helpful. You have to decide whether you want group support, perhaps, or with an individual counsel, I it's better. I figured that my Medicare didn't give me much in the way of help for dementia. So I took advantage of counseling once a week because that's more comfortable to me. I would rather talk about my problems individually. And believe me, just letting out steam is, is very useful. So that was another advantage that cost me absolutely nothing. Um, Accepting friends. One of the things that occurs is that people aren't quite sure what your spouse is going to do next. And your friends tend to not be quite as inclusive as they were. But hang on tight to those friends who will accept that dementia and still invite you. And I think that's something that the churches could um, cope with, too, because if church members would keep in mind that these people become more isolated because of behavior problems, maybe they could be sure that people were included better. Because it is uncomfortable when you go to dinner and your husband wets himself happens though, and when you get him home and say to him, where was your pad? <laughs> he says, well, I was out of pads. Hmm? Not his problem. Didn't make him feel bad or uncomfortable. So you mustn't let those things make you feel uncomfortable. But you do probably need to anticipate that that will happen again and be sure there are plenty of pads in the cupboard and that your person changes them frequently. So your friends can be very helpful. We have, we have the, the ability to pay for some caregiving and we, we hired a caregiver who turned out to be just marvelous because my family was young in Tucson, they all worked. It was not easy for them to come down and, and do what needed to be done to provide me the respite that I eventually needed. So by paying someone and generating um, that, that caring person who stayed with us to the end was worth it every of it. My doctor had suggested that we have, um, that we move to La Posada. And I didn't want to do that. That wasn't what I was going to need. 
So I considered it just wrapping services around me. If I needed a cleaning lady, if I needed a handyman, whatever it was that would get us through with the least amount of expending resources. Because long-term care is extremely expensive. And you have to plan for that very carefully, depending on your resources, as you make those choices. I want to tell you about the three, the threes. The threes came along sort of in the middle of this. All of a sudden, we had to have three separate cereal boxes. And those three boxes had to be there consistently, and he had to pour some of each of the three in a bowl and eat it every morning. Same thing. Of course, he just wanted fruit loops and, you know, awful stuff. And I said to the doctor, God, his diet. And the doctor said, you ain't gonna die of a bad diet. <laughs> and he didn't. So what could have been a contentious problem was just solved with a little bit of sense of humor. He also wanted three newspapers. Every day we had to have we had to have the Arizona Republic, the Tucson Daily Star, and I don't know. Green Valley, Green Valley News. The Green Valley. Well, no, because that's not every day. These were every day. Wall Street Journal. He never read it. He was a truck driver. He didn't read the Wall Street Journal. There you go. He had them every day that he wanted them until he was to the point where he wasn't reading newspapers anymore. But then I started buying great big picture books of the prairie from a trucker's point of view. And he had some wonderful picture books. He could look at them for hours and think about what it was like to be on the prairie again. And that kept him comfortable. It's really all about being comfortable, but also being careful about yourself as a caregiver. And we did reach the point where I did go away for a week every few months. And one morning the caregiver called and I was in a meeting someplace and she said, I've lost him. I was talking to my husband and he, he wandered away and I said, yeah, he does that. Call SAV and sit there and wait. Send your husband out to look. He's going to turn up. And he did. He was sitting there petting the dog on the bench nearby. Was I going to stop and worry about it a thousand miles away? Not on your life. Was I going to rush back home? Not on your life. Those breaks were my breaks. And that was what was keeping me sane. And it was keeping me healthy. It's serious that at some level, if they're at home, you're going to be walking. You're going to have to be available 24-7. When it gets to that point, my solution was to put the lock on his bedroom door. Now, why, why did we have separate bedrooms? Because way back there in the middle of this journey, his behavior in the middle of the night was just weird. He was hallucinating and seeing things. He'd be standing on the bed saying, come on, you guys, help me fix this. Something. Help me fix the car. Help me do this. Or he'd, he'd, he'd wake up yelling. And I'd, I'd say, what's wrong? And he said, well, there's all these people here in the room. Do you see them? And I said, no, but 
what do you want to do? Do you want me to chase them out? And he said, no, they probably don't have any place to go. I guess it's okay. And went back to sleep. Now, I'm not going back to sleep. <laughs> but I did come to the conclusion we were going to have separate bedrooms. <laughs> because I did need as much sleep as I could get. The other, the other thing was TV programs. How about the cowboys from our, you know, the geometry, that kind of thing. But that was, that was nice. He could watch those in the evening. So we got we got to the point where this had gone on for about six, seven years, and it was a gradual decline. I was still determined that he was staying at home for two good reasons. He still had his sense of humor, and I could, just like that gentleman, make him laugh. And he had good manners. So it was very easy in that sense, but there was a lot of anticipatory stuff. There was the falling, the, the skinning of the arm, the, you know, all the kinds of things that went on. You eventually, or I eventually, at the last, um, it was like it was like when you have a baby and your antenna are up and you're you're constantly alert to maybe to intercede and make the person comfortable. And that's something we do with babies. But we're old ladies now. <laughs> we're not 20 year olds having babies. And that takes that that is a burden and it takes it takes energy and it's very difficult. So I think sometimes you make a choice to put your spouse in a facility. I didn't have to because, as I said, you know, you've got a sense of humor. I mean, <laughs> and you've got good manners. Of course you're going to be home. So he went to La Posada's daycare, and one day he had been, he had been sort of, going slower for a week or so, just sort of physically not, you know, moving as much. And he went to daycare and collapsed. And they called. Now, I had been very proactive and enrolled him in hospice very early because that gave me a choice of hospices it gave me the, the comfort of knowing that when the time came, there would be someone there immediately, and I wouldn't have to go through the whole enrollment thing with the doctors and the whole bit. And so I called hospice. I called my daughter in Tucson. She called my granddaughter. And within an hour or so, we were home. But before we got home, Lapsana had to call 911 because he had to have, after all, collapsed at Lapsana's daycare. And so the fire department came. Now, the fire department is trained to take you to the hospital. They are not trained to take you home. But I had a husband who needed to go home. And the, the director of La Fasada very, very comfortingly interceded and said, I have their DNR. These are our clients. They do not want to go to the hospital. So here is a wheelchair. You wheel him out and you put him in her car. And then you follow her to her house take him out of the 
car and put him in his chair in the bedroom. And they did that. They were grouchy. <laughs> <laughs> did they make me feel better? No. They were very hurtful because that's not their motives. Did I resist them? Sure. Because we had decided we were not going to do anything but comfort care. And that could best be done by petting the dog in his chair, in his bedroom, through the final few days. Hospice came, they got everything arranged, the caregiver that we had been working with took one look at it and said, yeah, I'm going to go home and pack a bag because I think I'm going to stay. And she did. And that was wonderful because she was with him 24-7. It left me free to begin my grieving in my own way and to have some time to adjust to that final period. We had already resourced where we were going to send him for crematory, you know, to be cremated. So it was simple for her to call them, have them come and pick his body up and take him to have that done. And I think one of the real blessings at the end was the fact that our oldest grandson was getting married three days later. So there was this whole family shift immediately from the dying part to the joy of celebrating a new marriage for these 30-year-old kids who were met in love, just as we had been. And that made it much easier. Now, there's a period of recovery afterwards. It took me about a year or so to really physically feel normal because it's, it's, it's just a very stressful thing. And that stress, oftentimes, if we're not careful as caregivers, gets us before it gets the person we're taking care of. And that, to my perspective, is to be avoided at all costs. My husband would not have wanted me to go first. And so that's my journey. They're all individual, just like everybody's dementia is individual. But there are resources in the community. And I hope you take advantage of every single one of them because it's not an easy journey and they should give us all some kind of a medal. <laughs> <laughs>Thank you very much, Linda. We're going to do um, now break out groups, and so I'd like for you to swing your chairs around, uh, find three or four people to talk with, and do two things in your breakout groups. One is to identify anything that you heard from Linda that seems particularly valuable, something that's important to hang on to. And then any questions that you have, we'll give you about 10 minutes in your breakout groups so go ahead and move your chairs around, groups of three or four, and we'll go from here. And
we don't need we don't need the podium. We'll just use this. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much. We have several questions for Linda. Uh, you got some more cards? Okay. Guy, would you bring them up for us? Thanks. So uh, Linda, uh, would you just stand up here with me? And I think this mic act hopefully will be uh, just as good or better. Um, what was the hardest thing for you? But the mind dies slowly. I'm probably a nerd. <laughs> and it, that was, it, was, it was very, very difficult. The slowness of it. And the watching of some. My husband could take apart a tractor and put it together. And at the end, he couldn't figure out how to get the key in the door of the car. Yes, I know. It's sad. It's yes. just it's just hard to see. But you steal yourself and you go on and you provide the comfort and the caring and anything to make them laugh. Next question is how do you handle a patient that doesn't want to do something, refuses care or assistance or whatever? Tell them that, and this is personal experience, tell them that their attitude is not acceptable and that you didn't sign on for this either. And that you are going tomorrow to get a chest x-ray because that's what it takes to put you in a facility. And then you take them to get the chest x-ray. And then, in my case, the behavior changed immediately. He was angry. He was angry. Why would you not be angry? I was trying not to be angry, but I wasn't losing my capabilities. Now, you're probably not supposed to do that, but that's what I did, and it worked. <laughs> What was the time span between when you started noticing some behavioral problems and when he was diagnosed? Probably about a year and a half. Turns out that his really was genetic. His sister died of dementia three years later. So, and the same thing happened. And it, yeah, it was just a year or so because there was just something so off in getting offered. And you wanted to know what was going on. And we had a really caring doctor in Kansas who did that little test and was able to sit down with both of us and say, you didn't pass. Now, I don't recommend you continuing testing because it just, it's difficult for the, the person. And guess what? They're only going to get worse. So why would you test somebody who's only going to get worse? What was it like for you to be able to accept his being diagnosed? Was that hard or is that something that was a relief? I think it was really hard to accept that this could actually be happening because we had such a wonderful marriage and we were so happy and he had just retired and we were going to go travel the country and do what we had always talked about doing. So it was very, very difficult to accept that those things were not going to occur and that our lives were going to be different. But because I learned, I read a lot of books, and I did, I did the study, and I took the classes, and once I understood it, we might as well accept it because there's anything I could be able to do it. You used that phrase from hope to cope. Yes. We went from hoping to coping. 
I, I thought that was really a catch uh, phrase there that really helps. Um, so um, just one more question um, on this level, and that is, how did you handle the guilt? she's not here is because among other things one of the actors was ill so she's <laughs> scrambling around and trying to get that thing off the ground and there's more information about Posada Life and that daycare program for you next week we will have other guests from the community we have uh, um, Chris Erickson from Valley Assistance Services will be with us uh, Regina will be with us we have invitations out to several other organizations as well so that they can be telling us about their services. And did you also notice her connection with the, with the uh, Sheriff's Auxiliary Volunteers, the work that they do? Yeah. That really needs to be highlighted to have your loved one registered with them. Those are the kind of tips that uh, can really make a difference in one's life. So thank you so much for coming again today and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. This is the mantra for those of you who are caregivers. Let's read that together. No act of love is ever a waste of time, even if it feels futile and even if it's not valued by society. Your loved one's soul or spirit, their person.